Welcome to CivilNet. My guest, a very special guest, is Ambassador Sergiu Celac of Romania. Ambassador Celac is here in Armenia at the invitation of the European delegation to deliver a series of lectures and talks. Ambassador, thank you very much for joining us on CivilNet. Thank you for having me. Uh, you were Minister of Foreign Affairs at a very difficult time for Romania, transition from the Ceausescu world and period to independence and on the path to Europe. Uh, Armenia is still on the path to Europe and 20 years later we're asking ourselves what that means and how do we really get there and I suspect Romania is still asking itself we're in the European Union but are we where our dreams wanted us to go do you have any words of wisdom for us not necessarily because uh, wisdom doesn't come with uh, administrative position or no which is why I'm asking you because I know there's <laughs> wisdom there <laughs> um, well first uh, it was fun being foreign minister at the time when uh, everything was in shambles and everything had to be invented this is a chance one really gets in a normal lifetime so I'm I'm really grateful for that uh, but what uh, I'd like to say about Europeanness are two things. First, that in the hot days of the Romanian Revolution, which was violent and messy, unlike other countries in Central Europe, uh, one of the things that the young people were shouting in the streets was back to Europe. Back to Europe. Not just. To Europe. Let's go to Europe. It's back to Europe where we belong. That was their feeling. Uh, now, earlier today, I, uh, I talked to young students and I mentioned about uh, the new geography uh, of Europe and the fact that the Balkans is not Southeast Europe. The real Southeast Europe is South Caucasus. Uh, and the response was mixed. Not everyone in the audience appeared to feel they were Europeans. How old was this audience? Uh, mostly undergraduate students. Really? And they doubted it because they didn't know if Europe would accept them or if they agreed that Europe is the place I don't know. It's just a Im superficial impression. Mm -hmm. But I think that the first condition of being European is to want to be European, to identify as a European. It doesn't mean renouncing your, your real identity as an Armenian, a Romanian, a Georgian, or whatever. Uh, it means thinking in a certain fashion, having certain values and sticking to them, sharing ideals with like-minded people, not because of the geography, but because it's something deep down. It doesn't come naturally. It doesn't come automatically. It, it is nurtured and educated. And uh, it is a good feeling to be a European, even when Europe appears to be failing you know, a little bit. Let me see if I can ask this in a, in a sensible way. I think that for Armenians, uh, Europe, of course, is the ideal. I don't think, I cannot imagine that that is something that people would dismiss. Um, it is an ideal, it's just that we don't quite understand what it's going to take to get there. And my feeling is that for countries like Romania, where the, the European evolution was a natural evolution over the centuries, you know, Enlightenment, Reformation, guilds, uh, all of that process was natural. Now, being a part of Europe is not just something that will come. It's a checklist. It's things you got to do. And that's tough. Uh, that means top-down determination and will and bottom-up willingness. How do you teach that, bring that? Because we're having a hard time with that. How do you get to that point where the top realizes this is a conscious process now? It's not just a, we belong and so it's finished. Uh, early on, even before 
the prospect of uh, membership in the European Union was a very remote dream for most Romanians, including the political class. And it was described rightly as wishful thinking. Um, the opinion polls showed an overwhelming uh, attachment to the European idea. Even though people didn't know what being in Europe, What's in the European mean? Union specifically, actually meant. But it was perceived um, almost uh, automatically and subconsciously as home. Uh, you can, cannot do that by sheer propaganda. Sure, but how do you, now are you finding that simply that feeling of belonging is insufficient impetus to make the structural changes necessary? Is it sufficient? It, it takes leadership, of course. Uh, it is not uh, disparaging for the will of the ordinary people in the street that they need to, to be led in order to know where they are going. No. But it takes a lot of explanation. What does it mean in the life of every person, every family? What Europe does for you if you go for Europe? That is the essential thing. And uh, I know there are at least two offers on the table now. And it is the Armenians that will have to make up their mind, judging precisely not from the abstract benefits of belonging to an elite family, but what does it do for my family? What are the prospects for my kids, whether I go in one direction or another? Uh, how better off they will be when they are adults. Mm -hmm. Not because of my sacrifice, but because I brought them into a better environment for personal development. That makes sense. It is not only a question of money, although money counts a lot. It is also that in every family people make calculations when you decide to buy a house or a car, you gather around the kitchen table and you discuss it. That is what has to happen. And especially when you have, or think you have, alternatives, you have to discuss that in every family and to make it happen. Here is where leadership can help. To help people discuss with their wives, with their kids, with their grandmother, with the facts on the table. An informed discussion is the fountainhead of wisdom, what you call. Is there an example of that sort of post-communist open discussion environment that we can look at? Did that work somewhere? I think open discussion can work anywhere. There are no exemptions from, from the rule. But in terms of open public political discourse, is there a place where that succeeded and helped push the, the society along? It seems to have worked in the Baltics. Yes. Um, where in the Balkans can we say that it, it really did work, that somehow in this post-communism environment there was the ability to go to open, tolerant, thoughtful political discourse? Because we have a hard time doing that. And I don't know where the examples are to show us that, look, it can be done. One does not need to distrust or fear the public. It's OK to discuss and question very, very important issues, like, does Armenia go the way of Russia, or does Armenia go the way of the European Union? Let's take the tough example. And the tough example is the countries that had recent wars when they killed each other. And when the memory of tension and mutual crime uh, are still alive. All of the Yugoslavia republics. And there, are, there is a mixed record of results. But Croatia is going to join the European Union 
as the result of ratification process. They negotiated every chapter. Serbia is moving along nicely and will probably have a decision before the end of this year on membership. Uh, if that can happen uh, in spite of recent bloody and messy history, why not here? Uh, not because you also have a conflict and had a war, but because you are used to tackling tough problems and you are facing with tough problems. Uh, so uh, I have no choice but to be an optimist for Armenia as well. We accept. <laughs> thank you. On that note, uh, thank you, Ambassador Sergio Celak of Romania, who was here in Armenia at the invitation of the European delegation in Armenia. And we're pleased that we were able to talk about the issues that are really at the core of every issue and conflict in Armenia. Which direction, how do we get there? Thank you for following us on CivilNet. <laughs>